Sitka, and today we are going to start by answering some questions from the Discord server. Uh, primary question that we are going to start with is how do you break up workouts throughout the day? Let's talk about programming quickly so this uh, so that this question makes con so that this question makes sense in the context that we're talking about it in. I design programs to be in time controlled chunks so that people are more likely to do them and more likely to get what they need out of them. So I write some short programs down to 10 minutes long, building up to 25 minutes long. There are time under tension programs that run between 20 minutes and 40 minutes. And we can stack any of our ideas together. All the programs that I write are specifically designed to Tetris into one another. We have our pure basics, which are like swings, clean and press, the squat program, which is coming out, Turkish get-up program, which is coming out, two-hand club, single-arm club, uh, pure basics. And then we have other types of programs like body weight programs, which are meant to teach people how to do a specific skill, usually getting up off the ground. Most of the body weight programs that I talk about are different versions of getting up off of the ground because those are a very human athletic skill that I don't see being covered in other types of training well. I see them being covered, but not being covered in such a neurological volume that they are impossible to forget when your heart rate is high or under stress. So if you wanna do multiple workouts throughout the day because that's how your schedule works, you wake up in the morning and you do 10 minute swing program before you go to work and then after work, you, have, you do a 20 minute body weight program or you do a sport or something. How do we line up the warm up and the cool down for that? Do your warm up first thing in the morning before your first workout. Whatever your first workout is, do that warm up. Uh, or do the longer version of the warm up that's not specific to that workout. So if you're doing a swing program, sorry guys, it's like 100 degrees out here. We're gonna be sweating through this t-shirt real quick. Uh, do your eight to 12 minute warm up in the morning because that is your morning cup of coffee. You are waking up the body and you are turning on the systems one step at a time. Think of it as flipping the breaker switches uh, on a power box in a house. Everything is shut off when you go to sleep. When you wake up, you start running through the different systems and you start clicking on switches. Usually the primary things that we wanna focus on are neck, the most important thing, shoulders, hips, and then spine. And we usually like to fit that into eight to 12 minutes. If you get longer than that, you can do that, but people get less likely to do it the longer it gets above 12 minutes. I find 12 minutes is about the line of what people will do specifically in the morning. Then do your morning workout. Then do a short cool down if you have time for it. Almost everybody after their morning workout is gonna sit in a vehicle and they, when they sit down, their hip flexors are gonna get short and their hamstrings are gonna get short. So if you've done a hard workout, you will adapt to the sitting position. So you, what you need to make sure you're doing is putting in some small amount of cool down after the first workout. It could be as simple as two to three minutes of sphinx pose, extending the spine, and then two to three minutes of forward fold, lengthening the hamstrings and opening the lower back. Short could be six minutes. I like to put in at least 12 minutes, six, 12 minutes after every short workout, but I'm getting old and I have a lot of injuries. If you're not as injured as I am, then you can probably get away with doing less, but that has to be an experiment for you. And then if you're doing a workout later in the afternoon uh, or at some other time of day, any other time of day, you can probably skip the warm up because your system is already on. Um, especially if you've been moving for a long period of time, if you've been walking or getting, keeping your system up, then yeah, if you took a nap before the second workout, then you would need to do a whole new warm up because you would probably have to click all those systems back on. Uh, I would love to nap, but I haven't taken a nap in like 15 years. It sounds truly glorious. And I love anybody who has a life in such a way that would allow them to take a nap. Uh, but I don't, I don't have that. So I don't do a second warm up before a second workout. Um, usually, uh, if it's one of my programs, because I already know what all those movements are. But if you were to do something like jujitsu in the evening, then I would put in a jujitsu specific warm up, but I would lead it away from the primary ideas 
uh, in the warm up neck, shoulders, uh, spine, and hips. And I would move it more towards warming up specifically for rolling or something like that. Uh, half kneeling, same side, shoulder roll series, alternating shoulder rolls, standing shoulder rolls, break falls, all that other stuff that you would need to do. Um, but always try to keep those workouts short uh, or keep those warm ups short. Eight to 12 minutes in the morning. If you're doing another one of my programs, you probably don't need to do another warm up in the afternoon. If you're doing some type of unregulated effort like jujitsu where somebody's trying to rip your body in half, then you, can, then you probably wanna do some type of warm up specific to that. Do your long cool down at the end of the day. So kind of bookend your days with the best warm up in the morning and the best cool down in the evening. If you're training multiple times a day, your evening cool down should get longer because it will help you recover faster, which will allow you to do two workouts the next day. Don't shortcut the cool down at the end of the day. If you do, you will not like it. Your performance will definitely suffer and you're just gonna, you're not gonna like life. It's gonna suck. So take that extra 20 to 30 minutes if you're doing multiple workouts a day at the end of the day and make sure you're focusing on extending the spine, flexing the spine, uh, rotating the spine. Those are your cores, core cool down movements that you have to do. Then probably after that, probably hip flexor of some type. Then after that, some type of integrated stretch uh, specific to whatever you just did. Um, cool, that's a good start. Let's uh, check on all the questions. Everybody came on. So in the future, I'm just gonna open it up and start talking so there's not dead time at the beginning and then I will start taking questions after we talk about the first thing. Uh, Marvin Juarez, where's the juggling program? Same place all the other programs are, in edit. Although I did just have a meeting with an editor and hopefully I will have somebody editing videos for me or helping me edit videos so that I can start going back to what I should be doing, which is really focusing on program design. I love writing programs. Uh, based on some questions I had yesterday. Am I still live? This thing's still going? Yeah, it is. Sorry, I'm having trouble with signal out here as I always do because everything's falling apart. Um, I sat down, I wrote two big programs yesterday based on ice skaters. They're a little bit outside my normal format, but something programming for something like ice skaters requires me to be a little bit outside of my normal format. Um, but I did both of them yesterday, and then I decided I was gonna write a whole mace program. Um, I wanna write a mace series that is slightly different from anything I've seen before. I'm sure somebody's done it, but uh, I haven't seen it. If, um, where I'm just gonna pick a specific idea, and I'm gonna write a program all around a specific idea for mace. We could talk more about that later, but it, it was fun. And I really like doing that, and I would like to just start hammering those out as well because in the pantheon of how we think about training, we think about our big core programs, our big lifts, our swings, our clean and press, our squats, our Turkish get-ups, our snatches. Uh, Turkish get-up program is going to be coming out by hopefully by August. Um, it's half shot. We just have to shoot all the explainer videos and then assemble it and package it. Um, we wanna get through all those big, massive core programs that all last for multiple years but I would like to start putting out some much smaller, more focused programs that do focus on foot movement. So when I think about training, I think about core lifts without much foot movement because it allows people to have the greatest benefit in the least amount of time for the least amount of money. They can start going up in weight and going up in weight will force them into better overall structural alignment and they will get better at the core basics and that is the foundation of fitness, those core movements, the same idea that people have in Olympic lifting. We're just doing it with kettlebells because kettlebells are cheaper. And now with the advent of adjustable competition kettlebells, you have an infinite amount of training you could do. You could easily expand any of those programs into five to seven years. If you really, really wanted to push them, you don't have to do them that way. You can do a year or two years of them, put them on afterburner and then come back to them several years later. But then those are all non-foot movement programs. Uh, then we have foot movement programs, mace stuff. Uh, mace stuff is where I like to put a lot of what you might consider, consider activity or sport specific preparation 
without having it be specific to sport. I'm having what I consider to be activity specific preparedness and sport specific preparedness for just basic human movement instead of for soccer or football or lacrosse or rugby. Um, I'm filling in a bunch of things that I don't see being done. So pure basics, probably non-foot movement, probably going up in weight, uh, kettlebell and club. And then I want to start doing some human activity specific and human like athletic, how do I want to call this? Like sports specific preparedness specific to humans. We got to come up with a phrase for this. I'm thinking uh, human specific preparedness or something like that. Um, and then, so I want to start putting out a bunch of those little programs because they focus on different types of stepping patterns that are in all sports. So I'm kind of trying to create a new category of training. So normally we have general physical preparedness, activity specific preparedness, sports specific preparedness, and that leads to mental emotional preparedness. I'm trying to change that pyramid to just human specific preparedness. So general specific preparedness for humans, um, activity specific preparedness for humans. And that would be like where slam ball is for the most part. And then uh, human sports specific preparedness, the things that we are good at that nothing else is good at, which will probably be a bunch of mace and hydro core programs focused on emphasizing specific types of stepping patterns. And then all of that will lead to the mental emotional preparedness needed to just be a human. Um, that's the idea. Somebody write all that down in the discord and tell me to make videos about that later, about that idea. Uh, so that I can put it on YouTube so that we can make sure it's in the, what do we call it? The Pantheon, the Pantheon of ideas that we're working on for the next several years. Uh, what was I talking about there? I was talking about, uh, when, um, that program comes out, it's on the list. The juggling program is lower on the list, but it will go into the human activity specific preparedness. But I would like to do mace before I do the kettlebell version because then we have kettlebells, which is acting as our intermediate heavyweight. Then we have club, which is acting as our intermediate weight. And then we have mace, which is acting as our lightweight. And then they'll all cycle together very, very well. So I'm still trying to stick to my heavy, medium, light idea of training. It's all 17 levels deep. And boy, we are nerds when we talk about this stuff. So the juggling stuff will happen after a bunch of the mace stuff is done. I wanna start with five of those MACE programs and then expand that to 10. Um, we go all the way back up here. Uh, there it is, there's that question. Jeremy McMahon, uh, he's asking about warm ups and cool downs. Uh, we addressed that as the first question before everybody got online. I'm just starting the live and I'm answering that first question. So after we upload this to YouTube, go back and watch that, Jeremy Mc McMahon. Uh, Jens Peterson. Hey, how do you program AB or ABC style nerd math program with both functionality and aesthetics in mind? Um, well, all the functionality stuff we do is what we're covering so far. All of our pure basics are your pure function stuff. And that will be our human specific preparedness, um, our general physical preparedness for humans and that whole pantheon. That is just pure function stuff. If you wanna throw in aesthetics, you simply throw in a pretty block of training, probably like chest twice a week uh, if you're dudes and probably like lats twice a week if you're dudes. Uh, if you're ladies, you probably might leave out the chest part and you might focus on some other body part like glutes or abs. Um, you just add other blocks after your functional training. We always do the most important parts of training first, which are the functional parts of training that keep us alive and help us stand up and extend all of our joints because those are characteristics of youth and athleticism. Then we always have our focus on cross body stability uh, because that is the thing that allows us to create power. And then after all that stuff is done, we can put in aesthetic blocks or sexy training blocks if we want to. Um, easiest way to think about sexy training blocks is pick three exercises for that muscle group, stack them in a row. Uh, we are going to have a bunch of programs that are gonna come out about that. Now that I have an editor coming on, hopefully we can get all that stuff out much, much, much sooner. 
Um, but if you're going to cut anything because of time, you cut the aesthetic block. Aesthetics are not really that hard to achieve in a, in a sexy, normal person context um, if you're already in really good shape. Like if you do clean and press, did I just lose? No. If you do your clean and press and your swing program and your two-handed club program, you are building the basis of aesthetics. It's all there already. Uh, then you just take those programs up and wait the same way that Arnold Schwarzenegger would tell you to do in the Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. Focus on your clean and press and your deadlift for a truly Herculean physique. And then we have the rotating component in mill squat plus arms plus abs. If you do all of that, you're by definition going to get sexier as long as the weight is going up and you're pushing yourself a little bit each time. And then you just throw in sexy blocks around the times you need to be sexy. Um, I tend to cut all sexy blocks of training like in the winter, because why? You're wearing giant sweaters and you're wearing Carhartts and everything else. So why focus on that so much? Uh, I do do something like bench press or push-ups in the winter because I get bored, um, but they're not specifically meant to be sexy. But if you're like doing beach prep or you're film preparing for a movie or something, then you would focus on your basics and put your aesthetics back from, the, from when you have to be sexy. So like for film training, uh, training actors for movies, you focus on all your core stuff for you know, months in advance, as much time as you can possibly get. And then when you finally get production to tell you when the, the, uh, the shirtless scenes are or the bikini scenes or whatever are, then you try to build backwards from there. Usually the hardest part about that is, is the food part um, because people don't like to eat super healthy food or super clean food forever. It sucks. It's not fun. Uh, especially if you're working 14 hours a day and you're super stressed out. Um, so you would backtrack that and you would try to start tapering your food to be into the super pure food land for that four weeks ahead of time. But you know, you can start 12 weeks out cutting out certain things or adding other things into the idea and you taper it towards in order to get people to keep doing it. What you don't want to do is push people too, super hard to be sexy in the beginning and then make it so hard on them that they stop doing it two weeks before they're supposed to be sexy and then they just give up and they do whatever the fuck they want anyway. Oh, I'm not supposed to swear, my bad. Um, they'll do whatever they want anyway and then you've ruined the whole goal. The goal is to get them to the place. Um, but yeah, you, I, you always program with functionality in mind first and sexiness second because sexiness adds a lot more time for a lot less benefit overall. Uh, Chris Wilson, how many days can I take a break before I need to start every exercise at a lower level? Uh, that usually depends on age. Um, for me, it's about five. Uh, when, it, when I was younger, it could last longer. Um, it was about 10 days, 10 years ago, where you could go, to, you could take 10 days off before you started really dropping. Now, for me, that window is much smaller. I'm getting old. Um, so I have to be much more consistent than I used to. For me, it's about five days before I start to notice it, like my heart uh, or something like that is not as fast at recovering as it should be. Um, that's up to you, but two weeks, you definitely got to take a step down. Um, 10 days is really pushing it. I think five days, uh, unless you're doing something super active. If you take two weeks off to go climb a mountain or something, then you probably don't need to take much step down at all. You probably only need to take like one or two step down days if it was active. If you just had two weeks off and you were sitting around, like uh, then you would definitely need to take step down. Uh, Uh, body weight 101 question. Hamstrings are tight, which makes straight legs, heels down, and hands down and down dog. Are straight legs a priority or heels down? Both. Focus on both of them. Alternate back and forth. You have to do both. Everybody has shitty hamstrings. Everybody has shitty hamstrings uh, in the modern world, except me, because I've been doing forward folds and full splits every day since I was like 12, because when I was young, I saw, I lived on an equestrian therapy horse farm 
and you saw people whose legs were so messed up and the first thing that went was hamstring flexibility. And when I was like 12, I saw that and I was like, well, I'm never gonna let my hamstrings go bad because it causes a cascade of horrible things. And the more you sit, the worse it gets. So the point of all the programs stacking up, like in the beginning, when, if people just try to stretch without a training program, it tends to go awfully for them because the hamstrings don't really function. Your brain's not really finding them. They just stay locked up. So doing things like swings and clean and press and mill squat program will cause the hamstrings to extend and uh, to lengthen and contract over and over and over again. And as you learn to flex your quads, you're trying to build reciprocal inhibition so that you can actively find your hamstrings with your brain neurologically so that they can start to relax. And then you have to start doing those forward folds all the time. Start with one minute, build to four minutes. And then if that doesn't work, then you would move to something like a box good morning, a box Jefferson curl where you hold a kettlebell in your hand, straight arms. You would go all the way down, try and hang with straight legs, a very light weight, a very light weight to start, very light weight to start, and then stand all the way up. So you're trying to put your hamstrings under perfectly straight load, extend and contract that way. Um, and then you need to do all the body weight stuff. You need to build into all the basic movements. Um, and we're gonna get more of those in the body weight programs where we're trying to get you into that down dog position where you're trying to get your heels down and your legs straight. Um, and then move in and out of that position. We're always trying to move people in and out of that position so the muscles can expand and contract in that position. And we try to overcome the inhibition in the muscles, which tries to keep them knotted up. All the programs are meant to interlace together, but when you're doing it in your body weight program, on one set, focus on knees. On the next set, focus on heels. On the next set, focus on knees. On the next set, focus on heels. You have to focus back and forth between them because they are equally important and the only way you're going to get it is by alternating your focus back and forth. If you just pick one thing and focus on it, you're never gonna get it, it's never gonna work out. Uh, looking for another question here. Reply, forearm tightness. Anyone have a POV? No. Uh, that's not a question for me. That's for somebody else. Uh, uh, when is the Conan program coming? Two-hand kettlebell club you spoke about a couple weeks ago. I wrote it down. Um, so what I need to do is I'm essentially treating this like film production. Um, I write the whole thing down. Then I do it four or five times because when you do it, you see the problems in what you wrote down. And then you edit it. You reorder things, you change the time under tension. You go, well, that's insane or this is too hard or that's an unreasonable thing to do. Uh, and then I try to just rough shoot it. I just throw the camera in the corner. I shoot a video. I edit it. No lighting, no, no cool background, nothing that looks cool. Not that my programs look super cool, but I at least try to find a cool background to do them or have a, like a semi-decent lighting. So I rough cut it. Then I assemble it into what we would call a pre in the film industry. Um, and then I take that idea so I can remember it and then I take that and I put it into the production schedule. Kind of treating this just like film. Um, this idea comes from stunt guys. So uh, directors have almost no control over fight scenes in movies anymore, unless you're like the guy who directed John Wick, who designed every movement in there. Um, your average director who's directing something like a Marvel movie or something, isn't really directing the fight scenes. They have a fight choreographer, a fight coordinator, and then they have all the stunt guys. And what those guys get together is the director says what he's looking for and he comes up with a big idea that needs to do this and they need to have these beats in there and these jokes in there or something. And the stunt guys do a bunch of versions of it where they just like Captain America, whoever plays Captain America just puts on a Captain America t-shirt, um, but no costume or anything, he just does it. And then they shoot it in a big room where they build the set out of cardboard boxes. So they have a general placement and then they can play with the set to figure out how far they need to move and then they shoot it and then they assemble it in editing and then they assemble it and cut it for time 
based on how long that fight scene needs to be for the movie. And then when they start doing the overall project with primary shooting, they have animatics or where they draw a lot of the interactions like comic book style. And then when it gets to fight scene, it'll cut to, cut to a bunch of ideas of the stunt guy doing the exact fight that they need to replicate so that on the day when they're shooting it on location with the actors in costume, they have an exact video and time reference for how everything goes. Um, and then they start pulling the footage in immediately and then they start plugging it in to replace parts of the fight scene so that they can check to make sure they have everything right. We're doing that, but we're doing it for programs. Um, so, when does it get done? Hopefully sooner rather than later because I just am signing a deal with an editor uh, so that I can spend more time doing what I should be doing, which is the writing in the previs so that I have stuff when I get a, a photographer or a camera guy in a location so that then I can replicate it faster and have a better overall quality and product. Long answer for when we get there. Uh, the things that are being done right now, we're editing Krav 1, which is a body weight get up program, which is meant to come after body weight 101. And we want to have that done in, I think, about four weeks from now. So whoever is going through body weight 101, the fastest possible path you could go through there without repeating it at all, there are some people who want to go right to Krav 1 and then be able to alternate Krav 1 with repeating body weight one with a weight vest or something like that. So we're trying to get that out. Once that one is out, then we're going to Turkish Get Up Mastery. Then I think I have to shoot uh, one or two of the MACE programs, which are just fun. I wanna do them because they're fun. And I think they're the most accessible for people because a 10 pound steel MACE is 30 or $40. Whereas two competition adjustable kettlebells are pushing $600. So in the interest of getting out programs that more people can do with the insane economic situation that we're living in, that's the order they're gonna go in. But maybe I'll do the two Mace ones, which is a short shoot. Then maybe I'll do the, maybe I'll do the Conan one. Maybe I'll bump Conan up. Um, I still haven't finished Duck Squat. Uh, hopefully now that I have some more help, we can get this done. Turkish half get-ups versus dumbbell press. Thoughts? Uh, plus one for tennis ball, underrated. Um, Dan Richardson, Turkish half get-up or dumbbell press? I assume you're talking about dumbbell floor press and Turkish half get-up. Primary importance, Turkish half get-up. It's more complicated movement, which has a get-up in it or a partial get-up in it. Um, so it's the most functional one. If you're gonna do dumbbell floor press, then that's probably leans into more of a pretty exercise. So I would do the dumbbell or the, tur the kettlebell Turkish half get up first and then the dumbbell part second. Um, it's a great idea. Uh, somebody, tell, somebody, somebody comment that later when we post this and we'll talk more about that idea because it's a good idea that we used to do 10 years ago and I don't talk about. Uh, did you know, I did not know, interesting name, is a 65 year old male too old to learn kettlebell sport for competition? Don't mind if I lose, just wanna compete. No, you're never too old. Um, that's the great thing about kettlebells. Uh, now with the advent of the competition adjustable kettlebells, you can take it all the way down to 12K and start working on your competition training, absolutely. Um, things you are definitely going to need to do in conjunction with that. Two-handed club. If you're 65 years old and you have not been focusing on your rotation for the, all of your life, then that's going to be the thing that kills you. That and extension of the upper spine. Um, if you don't have rotation or extension of the upper spine, you're going to get fried immediately. So you definitely need to start adding in double overhead presses, and then you need to be putting in lots of box puppy dog stretching and hanging stretching with your hands all the way close together to open up the upper back and the shoulders so that you can even reach the position of competition kettlebelling. Of course, you're gonna to have to stretch your hamstrings a lot 
a lot because competition kettlebelling is just an insane amount of load on your hamstrings. Um, if you're 65, you might need to get lighter weights. You might need to get two eight uh, competition bells and two 10 competition bells. The whole point of competition is not the pure strength, it's holding the weight and the endurance and getting into position, which is primarily the limiting factor, at least for me, is extension of the upper thoracic spine. Um, but yeah, you're never too old to start. You can definitely do it. You're just gonna have to probably spend a little bit more money on weights because you're gonna need those light eights probably and those light tens and maybe even light competition sixes, which do exist now, super badass. And you can definitely do it, sure. Um, almost any amount of double belling, even two eights, two eights is still uh, 16K, it's still 36 pounds. Like if you can lift 36 pounds overhead for five minutes at 65, you're crushing it. If you can get anywhere up above that, you're doing fantastic. Absolutely, if you get up to double 12s, you're doing, you know, 50 pounds overhead. Uh, 52 pounds overhead, and then with the bells, the competition adjustable bells, you'll be able to go to 12 and a half, and 13, and 13 and a half, and 14. Yeah, those competition adjustable bells expand the people who can do uh, competition training, I think, massively, and make it a really, really, really good idea. Um, we're all trying to eventually get toward competition lifting. A lot of this stuff I talk about is more specific to less equipment, and more movement patterns. The problem with competition lifting is you only focus on, you know, uh, your competition lifts are your long cycle or your clean and jerk, your snatch, your jerk, right? Am I missing anything else? What am I missing? Um, and they're all straight line up and down. Uh, so you have to balance that out with rotation training. Has to, you have to have something like single arm club or two handed club, definitely. Uh, call it Clifford. Do you have a video on hand transition for one arm club shield cast? Uh, yeah, hold it in front, change the other side. There's no fancy for one arm shield cast. You end with it right there. Just grab it with the other hand and move it over. It's the hand changes for inside circle and outside circle that get people on single arm. Uh, are you, do you plan to do a long cycle program? Not for a while. There's so much stuff to get out. I have 15 other programs before I get to long cycle. For the most part, long cycle shouldn't really be done by most people until they're probably in year four or five in my mind. Um, in the beginning of training, we kind of focus on hard style, pure clean, pure press, single dip swings, um, deck squats because we want to get full range of motion of the leg. We want to learn to roll our spine. We're forcing core activation. Uh, double front squat program because front squats are a core human movement. Um, and then we need all the versions of get up stuff because get up stuff causes you to twist and rotate your body in a bunch of ranges of movement that you absolutely need competition lifting or like long cycle is just highly specialized to just going straight up and straight down. Um, if you haven't done all the other programs and I don't see the need to put people into something like long cycle training right away, unless they already have some other type of previous athletic training, but I would then balance that out with all the other types of programs. So we're going to do the programs that have the most value first. Long cycle is really about crazy endurance and it's where you expand to and, you know, for the later years of kettlebell training. I think of kettlebell training like Kung Fu. In Kung Fu, you start with like hard styles or long styles first, these big, huge movement patterns that focus on maximum speed and power and the most complex movements. Um, and that's normally taught to like younger people first. Um, and then over time, Kung Fu bleeds towards efficiency and using the minimum amount of effort. So normally first, we wanna teach people to create a maximum amount of tension and a maximum amount of effort. 
And then as they get good, we teach them to be more efficient with the efforts that they are putting out. So a long cycle program is further down the line because we are covering efficiency in club training for the most part first. Kettlebells, intermediate weight, maximum tension, clubs, focus on rotation and efficiency first. So we cover that block of training in the first several years of training with clubs because then we're getting the rotation in. We're just always trying to get the best ideas out first. Um, speaking of stunt work, who is your favorite Batman? I don't have one. I don't think anybody's done a good Batman. I don't think a single person out there has done a good Batman. I think the last Batman movie, the weird noir one, was entertaining. I thought it was good. It was a dark, creepy version of Batman, and then they threw out all the fun stuff at the end by having him stand out in the spotlight underneath a rescue helicopter and all that other stuff. Batman's always supposed to be a detective, and he's supposed to be in the shadows. Um, you know, uh, detective comics. It's, we still haven't really gotten... The last movie tried to do a version of Detective Comics. They kind of lost it at a couple of points, um, specifically there at the end where you think the movie's going to be over and they catch the Riddler, and then they do this whole other thing. So for some reason, Gotham is below a seawall all of a sudden. I appreciated the artistic intent that went with it. I thought that was all fun. I like the last bat suit the most. Um, I don't think Robert Pattinson had the... What do we call it? The yeah, but his character is still developing. He doesn't have the full Batman thing. Batman's supposed to be twelve steps ahead of everybody all the time, and he wasn't in that movie. And I think that might be part of the character development if they're doing a three movie series. I think they should just make ten. I think they should just make one a year, and then just really run with the idea. You can do an infinite number of versions of Batman, um, but. Um, I don't like the Michael Keaton. I love Batman, the original Batman, 1991, uh, because we all loved that. It was the first time a superhero movie had really hit the big screen. Um, but they shot a lot of people with guns. I mean, he had guns on the Batmobile, a cool Batmobile. Um, but he also couldn't turn his neck or do cool martial arts in that. What we still haven't seen is the, the Ben Affleck Batman had some of the better choreography, I thought, because it was most like the Arkham games. The best version of Batman is the Arkham games, bar none, bar none. There's no question about that at all. The best movement design was in that game. The best suits were in that game. The best Gotham was in that game. The worst Harley Quinn was in that game. Um, I didn't like the Harley Quinn in that one. Yes, I am a nerd, and yes, I'm going to stop talking about Batman now. Sledgehammers as a poor man's mace, yeah or nay? Uh, they're not really cheaper. Maces are so cheap now. Um, unless you already happen to have a bunch of sledgehammers lying around, uh, maces do a better job for five more dollars. Um, if you're doing a sledgehammer and you pick up one that has a fiberglass handle, the head is too heavy, the handle is too light. If you try to do a bunch of the cool flippy stuff, the handle is too light and it's going to whip way too fast and you're going to hit yourself in the face. Spend the extra five or ten dollars and get a steel mace. They are not expensive. Um, at all at all they're not expensive at all i mean they're so cheap it's like you can get a 10 pound steel mace for the cost of you know post church sunday lunch uh and they last almost forever although i have bent a couple of steel maces uh using them to hit stuff that was too hard um no i i don't think sledgehammers are a good replacement i think sledgehammers should be used for sledgehammer stuff i think you can use mace for a lot of sledgehammer stuff like smashing tires uh, but I do not think sledgehammers make a good mace. That being said, I used to use sledgehammers before heavy clubs existed in a commercial sense. That's how I originally trained. Uh, I used to be a carpenter when I was a kid. I did a lot of push-ups and pull-ups, and I thought I was super hardcore. And I was on a uh, building. I was up in the rafters one day with this old guy, and he's like, and I was like, uh, doing pull-ups. I was instead of using the ladder, I was being a psychopath. I would just jump up, grab the rafters, pull myself up, and climb myself up onto the roof. And he said, ah, it's not bad. And I said, yeah, you know, I do pull-ups. And he's like, I bet you're not strong at all. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah I'm pretty strong. And he goes, all right, uh, we're going to do a test. We're going to see who can hang from the rafters the longest. And he smoked me. Um, we hung from the rafters straight 
arm dead hang. And I lasted, I don't know, maybe two minutes. And he was casual. He wasn't even, wasn't even hurting at all. And I dropped and he, I was like, shit. And he goes, here's another one. He grabbed a sledgehammer. He held his arm out perfectly straight. He tipped the sledgehammer back till it touched his nose and he stood it up. Um, and he goes, can you do that? And I picked it up and I went back and I got to about 45 degrees and I lost all control of the weight and I had to move my head out of the way so I didn't catch a sledgehammer in the face. And that's when I started training leverage training with sledgehammers. And what I did was I got a six pound sledgehammer and I went down a distance and I put one color of electrical tape, one hand below that. I put another color, one hand below that, another color. And I taped down it so I could control how far my hand was going down. And then I did the same with an eight, the same with a 10, the same with a 12. Uh, those were the only sledgehammers I could get. And I started doing it that way. That being said, the thing that I was doing with them accidentally recreated was inside circle, outside circle, and shield cast, which was later taught to me by people who did heavy club. And I was like, oh, it's the same thing you naturally come up with if you replicate a cross, a jab, and an overhead block, which is why I think they're the fundamentals. Um, but I would not use a mace, or I would not use a sledgehammer as a replacement for a mace. The handles are too light, gonna hit yourself in the face when you start trying to do all the cool flippy stuff. Uh, and teeth are more expensive than uh, a mace. Thoughts on risk of injury for L hypermobility of the elbow. Elbow bends past straight, specifically as it relates to ballistic overhead exercises such as snatch. Any way to ensure safety of joint? How much over are we talking about? Without knowing that, without looking at it, I can't answer that question. I'm sorry, guys. Um, you know, a lot of handstand guys overextend their elbows from years of pushing so hard, the same way that ballerinas can overextend their knee joint at the highest level of the sport. Uh, but I don't know what that means. Um, but you can probably solve it by changing the angle of your catch hand at the top from palm facing forward to thumb facing forward. Um, that would be my fast answer without knowing anything about the elbow itself. What would be a nice kettlebell program for swimmers? For example, to train for 400 meter freestyle event, what exercises would you recommend and types of sets? I would recommend exactly the basics of kettlebelling, tolga, Bahar, Tolga Bahar. Uh, how long does it take to do a 400 meter? I mean, me, it takes forever because I suck at swimming. But uh, let's say, what does uh, 25 meters take? 25, 30 seconds or longer, 40 seconds. Um, you got to figure out what your overall time is. And then I'll do the opposite of that. Um, for the most part, doing your kettlebells and your clubs are going to increase your endurance with your lat pull, which is really what we're thinking about when we're thinking about swimming. That reach up, that breathe, that head turn and that pull, and then that track, depending on where you're from, if you're doing a straight pull or you're doing the S pull, it's all the same, it's all lat endurance. If you do any of the basics of kettlebells and clubs, then you're going to have stronger lats and you're gonna have all the basic muscles that you need in order to do 400 meter freestyle. Um, and then because your freestyle is an endurance based activity, you could think of it two ways. You could do just a pure strength basics. If you've done all your pure strength basics and you've racked it up to 32 K for your clean and press and your swings for your kettlebells, and you've done 50 pounds for two handed club program, then I would start moving you to time under tension protocols for both of those things. So you can get your lat to fire and your core to stay on for that entire period of time. Um, and then you would have to do one side that period of time and the other side the same period of time. And then you would probably want to add 20% of that to the time it takes you to do a 400 meter. Rough idea. There's three ideas in there. Pure strength, rack up and weight, then go to time under tension, then match time under tension for each side of the body. Uh, yeah, so I don't know how long 400 meter takes. Uh, could take somebody four minutes, I think. No, no, it's got to be longer than that. I don't know. I can't remember my swimming time. I haven't been in a pool since 2019, and I'm a terrible swimmer. I grew up on a horse farm. I did not learn anything about swimming. We just got in water and flailed about. 
Um, no swim team or anything available where I grew up out in the country. Um, I did take a bunch of swimming classes when I went to USC. Uh, and to just, I took the same class like three times in order to work on swimming because I'm terrible. Um, and then uh, it's very hard to get access to like a real lap pool for most people. It's usually outside of the range of how much time they have to go every day. And swim times are awful, they're like 5 a.m. If you're in LA to get from like where my studio was in Glendale to the Rose Bowl at 4.30 every morning was awful. And then the people who are swimming at that time were so good that they were just, they didn't want you in the pool. There was no free swim for adults for people who sucked. Um, I did have access to an awesome pool in Romania uh, when I was training with an actor for a movie and we did a ton of swimming there and I was putting in an hour, like four days a week and just working on my freestyle, super fun. But I was doing it not as 400 meters because 400 meters would kill me because I'm not adapted to that in any way. And I was just doing like 25 meter repeats, 50 meter repeats and 100 meter repeats with set time frames. But I don't remember how long a 400 meter takes. Maybe somebody will tell me. Uh, uh, here's a nerd question. Eric Parker, who's your favorite Venture Brothers character besides Brock Sampson? How do you guys know I love Venture Brothers so much? How do you guys know I've seen every episode of Venture Brothers 10 times? Um, and gone to the panels at Comic-Con. I only went to one. It was the only one I could get into um, a couple years ago. When was that? Maybe 20? That's, it was a long time ago. 2015, maybe? Um, favorite character? Dean? No. I don't know. You want to say Billy Quizboy or the Monarch? He's probably the Monarch. Or 21. Let's go 21. Let's go 21. 21 has the best story in all of Venture Brothers. Um, the team Venture. Um, 21, because 21 has the best character arc in all of Venture Brothers. Um, I'm going to say that. Yeah, if they wanted to make a good Batman movie, they could just make Arkham Asylum. Instead of having a bunch of people try to rewrite stories over and over and over again, that was the problem with Star Wars. That was the problem with the Batman. Um, they got a bunch of people in there who hadn't read enough comic books who decided that they're going to write the movie and not fully understand the motivations like people who read the comics for 30 years. Um, oh, delivery. Somebody's going to have something off here. Walk past me probably. Let's see. Uh, here's a crazy one. Peter Steve. Three years ago, he received a complete reverse shoulder replacement. Left and right shoulders. Am doing kettlebell swings, clean and press with no problem. Want to start windmills and snatches. Which is first? First is Turkish getup, bro. Definitely. Turkish getup. And Turkish getup breakdowns 100%. You want to make sure you have side presses which you're going to learn in turkish get up breakdowns before you start doing something like windmills howdy yeah just pitch it right there thank you sir um you definitely want to start with like half kneeling press um half kneeling windmill before you start doing standing windmill because if you do standing windmill wrong you're going to roll your shoulder forward and you're going to put a ton of stress right there you want to focus on rolling that shoulder blade back and down and squeezing the shit out of the lat, which is easier to learn in the half kneeling position before the standing position. So do all the, the Turkish get up breakdown exercises first, then do standing Turkish get up training all the way through, then do snatches probably, probably then do windmills. Windmills are taught as an advanced exercise outside of the basic six exercises because they do weird things to your shoulder if you do them wrong. Um, so focus on the Turkish get up, then the snatch, then the windmill, then the standing side press, then the standing bent press, then the two hand anyhow, probably in that order. Uh, Peter Brook, 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 Peter Brook. Mark, what's the nerd math approach for running? I, for one, can do 10K no problem, how, but how can I get better, better, faster, and longer? Uh, Peter Brook, 
Um, I don't know if that's how you say his name, but that's how I want to say because he's got the two little dots above the U. Um, nerd math strategies for running. Uh, there are a million based on the environment or the type of running you're doing. You're doing a 10K, which is what? Six miles, which should be in the, what, 40 to 50 minute range. If you want to get faster, you know, if you're getting faster, what are you in the 35 minute range? Um, the way that you would get faster is you would keep your 10K running twice a week. And the other days a week, you would focus on pure power training. Um, you would focus on pure like hard style heavy swings and you would focus on sprint training so you could turn that into a six day a week program like that uh your long runs twice a week pure power for a kettlebell uh hip snap um pure power for that probably two days a week and that would probably be combined with something like deck squats or front squats or or single-sided front squats and then dead sprint training absolute speed training and then you would write a program based on like the 100 meter, the 400 meter, and the 800 meter. And then you would introduce objects into that sprint training. Um, and then you could probably take your 10K days at twice a week and introduce a heavy light. One day a week, you could be running with say a 10 pound vest on, uh, but not if you're heel striking. Um, uh, or introduce running with a five pound mace or something like that holding a mace in front of you in over under grip and working that weight swing back and forth and then flipping the heavy side uh, back and forth every minute, probably set your watch timer. Every time you hear a beep, you would flip it to the other side using like a running prayer transition and keep running. Um, yeah, short version of that. I mean, we could write that program all day long. Uh, we can write like three years of that program blindfolded. Um, no problem. Great question. Great question. Super fun question. Those are the fun questions. Any tips on kettlebell training for mountain biking? What rep ranges are better for endurance? Yeah, physical sports. Uh, same answer as the swimming because they're both endurance based activities. You would focus on your pure, pure basics until you got to at least 32 K with kettlebell movements. Um, because you're just building up your hamstring load and um, your quad load. You also probably put in something like deck squats for sure because deck squats get you into that really cramped position and integrate the push of your leg with the firing of your core and there's absolutely no way out of it. Uh, and then after you got to that, then you would put it into endurance time-based movements. Um, and once again, because mountain biking is straight line, you would need to introduce some type of rotationary programming for it. Uh, just so to get you out of that cramped mountain bike position. Um, I would like to make some videos. I have a buddy out in uh, LA who does mountain biking every day. He works at one of the studios out in the valley and they have lunch hour and all the dudes go out and mountain bike every day. And I'm so freaking jealous because he's got this sick job where he welds and makes cool shit for movies all day, every day. He makes sick money. And then every day he rides uh, his mountain bike for an hour and there's hundreds of miles of trails right there by the studio. So he can actually jump on his bike at the beginning of his lunch hour, go out and do a bunch of mountain biking, mad ascents and crazy descents and end up back with 10 minutes to spare, eat his lunch, dump a bucket of water over his head and keep going. Super jealous of that. Um, there's all kinds of fun stuff we could do. Uh, somebody remind me and we'll start making videos on all of these individual specific questions because these are big, awesome questions. And you can start doing a whole phase of athletic and sports specific preparedness for each one of these ideas, like swimming, like long distance running, like off trail running, like mountain biking. Mountain biking and road cycling, not really that much different because the time periods are long. Uh, I like mountain biking better, but it's harder for everybody to do because you got to have, you know, mountains or dope trails that you can ride on. Um, problem with most Midwestern cities is they decide to pave all the trails for some stupid reason. And then it just becomes riding on the road in the forest, which is awful. Um, taking all the fun out of it.
Uh, I have never worked in the Netherlands, Chris Lau. Um, I passed through the Never Netherlands on a movie once um, and just ran around for two days in what, Amsterdam or something uh, as we were waiting on transport or whatever for something else. And I know you guys do tons of swimming. When I was in Romania and I was at that dope pool, this big private training facility built by some famous tennis star over there. It's like a whole living community with condos. And they have this massive training facility with these indoor tennis courts. And they have these a huge outdoor Olympic pool. But it was closed when I was got out there. They wouldn't let me swim in it because it was winter, which I thought was lame. And then they had their 25-meter indoor pool. Those people just mercilessly roasted me. And I knew that they were all shitty coaches because the first thing they said was, your technique sucks. You should, row, you should swim 1,000 meters at a time. And I said, do you not see that I can barely make 25? If your advice for me as a bad swimmer is swim 1,000 when I can't do a 25, that is 10 times 4. That is 40% harder than what I'm currently doing. 40x, 40x harder than what I am doing. You're a terrible coach. So the problem with people who started learning a lot of stuff when they were young like that is that they don't understand what it's like not to know it. When you learn a skill and you get good at it, you forget what it's like to not know it. That's one of the things that I strive for in my coaching is to remember what it's like to be terrible at everything. I learned everything late. I grew up on a farm. I learned to work. I scrubbed stalls. I cleaned stalls, right? My whole life, I stacked hay. I didn't even play a sport. I started martial arts in sixth grade and that was Aikijutsu, but I didn't play like a sport until I was in high school, ninth grade, because my mom forced me to. We picked the sport that required the least amount of money, soccer. You had to have cleats and you had to have socks and that was it. And then you had to have a pair of shorts and a shirt, uh, which they gave you on the school team. Much, much cheaper than football, which we could just simply not afford. When I say poor, I mean, we were below the poverty line poor. Um, so I didn't know the rules. I got yelled at all the time by people who had been playing since they were eight. Um, I outran everybody and I destroyed everybody uh, just by doing 500 push-ups, 500 sit-ups and running through the forest with a sword every day. I could run forever and I could do all this other stuff. But people who are good at something tend to forget what it's like to not know things. I am very happy that you guys have education for swimming in the Netherlands. I wish that we in America had better education on everything. The one thing that the Eastern Bloc did better than everybody else was their sports education. Uh, I think of it like this, like America might produce like the, some of the top 10 gymnasts in the world. Um, and then the Eastern Bloc countries uh, make people, those 10 people just as good. But the difference is they make another 100,000 of those people who are a micrometer below that level because their sports education is so good. People from the Eastern Bloc tend to be monstrously good swimmers and they can swim forever. I mean, they invented kettlebell sport and I think that they invented it for endurance weightlifting because if you were trying to create a super soldier, which they were, then that's how you would do it. You would make a guy who could lift 140 pounds nonstop for 10 to 30 minutes because that guy's terrifying because now a 70 pound backpack loadout is not that heavy for a guy who can pick up 144 pounds and not put it down for 10 minutes or longer and then go faster and faster and faster. The Eastern Bloc guys have way better sports education than us in their youth. That does not mean that they're good coaches. Some of them are great coaches, but not all of them are good coaches for the audience that I am talking to. Um, the audience that I am talking to is people who grew up like me for the most part, people who did not have the best possible education, people who grew up by the skin of their teeth, and now they're trying to get health and fitness and get better with what they have. Still, we're still trying to answer that equation of the least amount of money, the least amount of time with the greatest possible benefit. We're engineering our solution for us. Other solutions are engineered to be learned when you're eight or you know when you're super young. And if you did that, there's a whole math thing on how much time they got in training before they turned 18, and none of us will be able to replicate that, so we have to be smarter with our design strategies because of that. We have to be smarter in order to be even comparable or comparable to people who had more hours of training. Um, 
my friend Amina, the Russian, Amina the warrior, uh, she was part of the Eastern Bloc system and she did Kung Fu from the, before she can remember. Uh, she was in uh, Russia and they took her and put her in a private school where they just did martial arts. Four hours in the morning, then they did school stuff, reading, writing, the basic stuff to make you functional as a human. Then they put them back in to martial arts for four plus hours every night. And they did that five days a week from five years old all the way until they're 18. Um, and they become incredible athletes, but they tend not to remember what the basics are because they were, it was beaten into them from the age of four to 10. Mark, have you ever used spring-loaded chest expanders in a training program? I haven't. I have seen them on TV, but I have never used them. Uh, I did a lot of push-ups back in the day. I used to do just like 500 push-ups and 100 pull-ups and 500 sit-ups every day. Uh, I never used the chest expander. I did have that thing back in college that has like rubber bands that go over your back to make push-ups harder. Um, but I've never used a band chest expander. Do you have a sit-up type exercise in your body weight one-on-one program? I'm trying to put a rogue wisecrack ab mat to good use. I do not because I did not want that program to require the use of any equipment other than the ground. Uh, I will put it in future programs, but I want to get through the first series of six body weight programs um, with no equipment. Because I don't want to raise equipment costs on anybody, especially with the economic situation that's going on in the world right now. Uh, we're trying to make it all as simple as possible right now. Um, if you would like me to make just a simple ab map program or something, then sure, I can knock that out. Um, I do love that thing. It, go, it lives in the back of my truck. I have two. I have a knockoff version because I want to see if knockoffs were, could be used. It's not nearly as good. Um, the Rogue one is the best. Um, and it lives in the back of my truck and I take it with me whenever I travel and I use it for stretching, for doing different types of get up stuff and um, for putting my knee on, uh, my bad knee on um, quite a bit. I love that thing and it's a fantastic piece of equipment and I think everybody should have one when you have the economic ability to afford it. <coughs> Could go to a pool for this Midwest weather, yes. I would love to go to a pool and swim laps outside because frankly, I'm tan from the waist up from being outside and working, but you're always wearing pants when you're working. So my legs are just insanely white and I would like to get my, my uh, Speedo out that I got in Bucharest and my goggles out, my Bucharest swim goggles and start swimming again, really get that tan going. But um, <clears throat> I don't know of any outdoor pool like that around here. Uh, but I just got a new motorcycle. I don't know if you guys can see that in the background. My last motorcycle was stolen in Los Angeles last year. I had a DRZ 400 Supermoto, which is super economical, brand new. You're looking at $7,500, maybe $8,000. Right now, dealers are putting a huge markup on everything, so it'll probably be nine or 10. But a used one is like $3,500 to $5,000. Um, my bike got stolen last year in Los Angeles. Out, right out in front of my buddy's house. Uh, and I replaced it after much him and hawing. I replaced it with a KTM 690, which is not a poor man's bike. This is the most expensive vehicle I've ever bought in my life. And it's the only new vehicle I've ever had. Um, I had a 2004, I still have a 2004 uh, Vulcan Mean Streak, which is my LA bike. Um, which is super sick. I love that thing, even though my sport bike buddies do not like it at all. I had a DRZ. Uh, it was a 2007. It was, you know, probably eight years old when I got it. Um, I had all through high school, extremely old shitty vehicles. Um, I had a 95 Jeep that I got in maybe 2004. I had an 86. <laughs> K5, and now I have my 2011 F350. Uh, and now I got this thing. I got this thing because of the parts shortage. This was the only one in five states. I had to go and get this bike in Pennsylvania, a six hour drive away. I had my buddy drop me off. 
and then I rode this thing straight back and I put 380 miles on it on the first day. But with the economic situation, I decided that if my money's gonna get worth less money, I'll buy this thing because uh, my money's getting worth less all the time. And it's got a warranty on it, so I can take it to somebody if something breaks in this first year or whatever. And um, this thing has 30 more horsepower than my DRZ for being almost the same weight. I think this thing might weigh maybe 10 pounds more, maybe, but this thing is a monster. Um, absolutely badass and savage. Uh, why was I talking about this KTM? I don't remember. Um, but yeah, uh, what are we talking about? Anybody, somebody remind me what I was talking about there. Something about vehicles. Uh, oh, here's a great one. Another simulacrum. 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 Where are we stealing that word from? That's uh, from, what sci-fi story is that from? Um, is that from Arthur C. Clarke? I don't remember where that word is from. Is that, is that word from the 1930s? Was that one of the original things that came before Blade Runner? Um, having another, or do I dream of electric sheep, technically? Uh, do Android dream of electric sheep? Uh, having trouble locking out my left arm when doing double kettlebell presses. There's no problem doing single arm presses on each side. Any idea how you can fix this? Absolutely. This is something that happens to almost everybody. Um, double overhead press requires an equal amount of movement in each shoulder and on each side of the spine. That tends to be hard for most people. Single arm press is where we always start because most stuff that you'll do in other types of training is double. If you go to the gym, you bench, it's double. If you use the machines, it tends to be double. Um, if you Olympic lift, it's double. Uh, so we tend to focus on single arm first because we're emphasizing cross body stabilization. And that's something that's not in another, that is not in a bunch of other forms of training as effectively in the same way. Kettlebells and clubs are by far the best thing at emphasizing that basic human trait. When people go to do double, Right? The problem with double kettlebells is it requires more movement, more range of movement than something like overhead barbell Olympic. In overhead Olympic, you can have your arms out to the side because your hands are wider than shoulder width apart. In kettlebells, your arms have to be straight up and down. They can't track outside. They have to be up and down. They can't track outside like they can in barbell and your spine has to be more vertical. You can't tip forward and rotate your shoulders in the barbell way in order to accomplish the task. So most people are gonna run into elbow limitations when they start doing double kettlebell work. You need to start introducing puppy dog stretch, two hands behind the head, elbows on a box, push your chest straight through, and then you need to start doing single arm lat stretch on each side. That could be single arm hanging from a bar, pushing your body towards the center to stretch one side and then pushing your body that way to emphasize that long line stretch of the lat. One side is going to be tighter than the other side. An equal amount of time on both sides and there's a band version of that where you run your hand through, grab with a band, get down into half kneeling position and roll to one side and five minutes, five minutes. Uh, and roll to one side. Um, so you probably have, it, and that lat stretch will also become a stretch up here for the majority of people. Um, there's a bunch of things it could be, but it's one of those things. And then of course you could put two hands close together. So shoulder width apart, hang from a bar, push your chest through. You need to do it on a bar height where you can put your toes on the ground so you can push your chest through. Uh, and then over time, the goal would be to move your hands closer together and drive your chest forward and through. Um, and one side is going to stretch more than the other. And so you need to restore that mobility. There's a bunch of other ways you can do it. If that's not working, then you would use like a 3.5 inch spiky physio ball and you would do whichever thing's not moving and you would crush that for X amount of time, two minutes to four minutes. Um, excellent, excellent question. That's why we stay away from doubles in the beginning. We tend to emphasize the single because if people are injured, then they can twist a little bit and their body will compensate micro degrees in order to accomplish the task. 
and that's fine. Double forces people to be in perfect alignment. And if they have a weak spot, it'll find the weak spot and it'll thrash it. Uh, great question, great question. <clears throat> Could you apply the same timing protocol uh, progressions from body weight one on one to other time under tension pro programs like mill squat program? Gotten this question a lot. Yes, you can. Um, it's not going to have the same effect. Uh, if you try to apply something like 60 60, that's a great idea. If you try to apply 2010, 2010 probably a terrible idea. Uh, you'll figure that out very quickly. Um, but 60 60 would work, 90 30 would work. The problem is you're going to have to go way down in weight. Think about 90-30. That's three times as many reps you're doing. So you're going to need to go way down in weight, which is a strategy you can use. I encourage people to do something like mill squat program and stick to 30-30 because it's enough work and it tends to put you in that range of eight to say 18 reps, which gives people the benefit that they want. They'll get more toned, sexier, faster. And by going up in weight and sticking with 30-30, then they will by jumping to other timing protocols. I'm specifically designed that program to have those three levels of complexity that you can rock back and forth between and then go up in weight. That was the goal of that program because when you go up in weight, you're going to learn more about where your structure needs to be in order to accomplish the task better. Oftentimes people will try to go to a lightweight and go longer and it just gets sloppy and it gets worse, not better. Can you do it? Yes. You can technically do whatever you want, I encourage people on the mill squat program to push the weight up so that they will learn more about lining up faster, which they can then apply to other things faster. I'm tr always trying to trick people into getting better faster. And each program does have an emphasis on why we're doing it a certain way. Great question. Absolutely fantastic question. Uh, Tessa Spivak from Australia. Wow, we finally got an Australian in here. Uh, loves doing the mobility work. Question, I am 5'1 on a good day. Should I worry about the length of clubs? Very limited range sold here. Cheers. Yes, you totally should. Uh, like the old R-Max clubs were longer and people, if they were under a certain height, like under 5'4", really had trouble with them. So they did make them shorter, the R-Max International Clubs. I think you have access to those. Um, that's one of the reasons I like the ADEX, ADEX, Adjustable Club and Mace system, because they start off pretty short. So they work for people of every height and size very, very well. The shorter lever does change the force production on it, but I think the sacrifice is worth it to have more weights in a smaller package that can be used by anyone. If you're 5'1", you're probably using those lighter weights anyway. Um, I think you could probably also definitely get away with the Onnit steel maces, which have a pretty good finish on them. Uh, but you're going to be in those, the shorter ones are 10. The 10 Onnits are very short. Um, the main thing is when your arm is straight down and your shoulder is away from your ear, swing it back and forth and make sure you're not crushing your toe. If you lean forward and you crush your toe, you did it wrong. Don't crush your toe. Stand all the way up. Outdoor swimming pool is greater than outdoor bikes. I agree. Uh, swimming pool is much cooler. Um, outdoor bikes are fun, though. I mean, mountain biking is fun. If you have a place to do it and you have the time to do it, super fun. Swimming is super fun. I wish, I wish I had a place to do it all the time. I would murder to be as good at swimming as my friend JP, who will go out and he will knock out 5,000 meters straight and just casual, casual. But he's a world-class triathlete. Um, watching that guy swim is just poetry in motion. Um, what are your thoughts on voodoo flossing, specifically with, with respect to knee pain and stiffness? Voodoo flossing is where they take these flat elastic bands and they wrap them really hard around the affected area and it compresses it very tight. And then sometimes they'll do like extension and flexion and stuff like that uh, in order to activate the muscles and pump it. Um, I think it works. Um, it's a cheap trick. My buddies do it a lot. Uh, when I was in therapy in Scotland, 
I was doing some therapy with a guy because he offered to do it. Love it. I've had my physio in um, bugs, bugs. Uh, my physio in LA do it. Um, love it. Fantastic. I think it works. It's a cheap trick. Uh, would I do it all the time? No. Is it fun? Yes. Um. Uh, Chris Lau, he's from the Netherlands. Um, he says swimming is a survival skill there because they're three meters below sea level. Three meters is over nine feet below sea level. Yeah, yeah, swimming was a skill there. You should be good at it. Um, uh, I perform very differently with different glycemic index foods. Any thoughts or tactics to be more versatile? Um, you got to tell me which foods, um, I take it. You're talking about like highly glycemic foods, like mashed potatoes affect your energy output level. Um, I would move away from, um, high index glycemic foods, move to sweet potatoes, sweet potato fries, instead of potato fries, that kind of thing, move towards more vegetables and meat. Um, try not to have, uh, any carbs in your first meal, make that first meal, vegetables and meat, have your first meal after your first workout. Um, that should help you balance out your glycemic index stuff just in general. Anybody who's overweight or heavier than they would like to be should also be doing that. Um, basically, all processed food in the modern world has way too much sugar in it, and it's tending to thrash the metabolisms of most people in the modern world. Um, so uh, if we can reduce or limit the time that we have high glycemic foods, I think that that is a really good idea. And I think that that will benefit everybody for their energy output throughout the day um, very much. Uh, what are your thoughts on zero shoes and natural foot shoe workouts? Love them. Uh, Zeros are the super wide toe box. I think I had a pair of those. I have no idea where they went. Um, I absolutely love wide toe box shoes and barefoot shoes. I also got a pair in Germany, which were like orange, which I have no idea where they went. I think they're probably in storage in LA. I have to go empty my LA storage. It just, now that gas is $7 a gallon for my truck, it just became insanely costly. And shipping that box here um, became like $7,000, which I'd rather drive all the way to LA on my motorcycle, uh, pick a, buy a truck or something and drive it back than that. Um, I love wide toe box shoes. I think that they're absolutely fantastic. Um, I wish that they had even softer soles on them. Uh, my, my mill, what are my boots? Belleville mini mill barefoot training boots are a joy to wear. A joy, a joy to wear. Hot weather, cold weather, running on rocks, whatever. They're awesome. Um, I like them better than any other barefoot training shoe I've had. They don't look very cool. Other shoes look cooler. If you tried to wear them in a gym with your short shorts, people would definitely think you're weird. Um, I used to have a pair of Zero shoes, which I would wear to CrossFit to keep everybody from making fun of all my other weird clothes. Um, uh, but yeah, I love them. I absolutely love barefoot training shoes. Um, I don't like the Vibram Five Fingers because they did something super annoying with them. That means that it's very hard to run off trail in. Even the leather ones have super jersey fabric between the toes, not leather. So when you're running off trail, like in Los Angeles, you just get these desert burrs jabbing between every single toe on every step. And then they get stuck in there and you can't run in them. Um, I wish that they would fix that. Uh, I love a good pair of Tabi shoes, Tabi, T-A-B-I, Japanese shoes. You know, we all had those ninja shoes in the 80s that you got and they were all fabric and they had the little buttons on the side. There's a bunch of much, much cooler versions of those. There's like hard toe tabbies. They have a super flexible toe and then toe caps over the toes. Uh, Japanese construction shoes. Got to get my hands on a set of those and they pull up and they Velcro across and then they lace up their dope. Um, I saw a monk, uh, an Asian monk, who looked like some type of Japanese monk wearing a super sick pair of white tabbies. Um, 
on the mall in DC when I was there shooting Wonder Woman. I looked them up. They're super sick. They were like 150 bucks in Japan or whatever in yen. So they were super expensive here. So I didn't end up getting them because I'm still super freaked out about spending that amount, much money on anything. Um, but I love them. I love them. Um, if there's a great tabby uh, that you can really wear um, that's easy to on and off and everything, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, somebody tell me. Um, Pete Wilson, hello from South Africa. Man, we're getting in the way, the way deep, guys. South Africa, dope spot. I had a friend from South Africa. Uh, she was a model. She was super cool, and she was like six foot tall. Um, that's all. And she had the best accent. Um, best accent to go to an art show and like talk to her. She always sounded cool. Um, Uh, how do you donate? I don't know. I don't know how anybody's donating. Um, honestly, I'm going to have to look this up. Uh, I have to look up. I don't know how you guys are donating. If somebody could explain it to me, I got to go. I'll have to sit down and watch videos on that. Um, uh, Brock Brown. Hi, Mark. Do you know if ADEX will be adding the Wildman extra fat club handle to their selection? Yes, they will be. Um, they have a little press release about it. They sent it to me this morning. I have to read it. It's a couple of weeks out. Um, supply line issues are insane. Um, the price of steel went up like 50, 55%. Um, they're trying to keep it at the, very close to the original price point. Um, they're going to be 50 total units for the first run and they're going to have to sell it as the whole set just economically after they sell the first 50 then they will be selling just the handles. I said, that's probably not a big deal. I always like more add-on weights because I can set up more stuff. Um, I don't think anybody else would have a problem with more add-on weights as well. They will also all be sold with the 1.25 pound weight um, so that you can make all the cool weights, the in intermediate weights. Um, yeah, those things are coming out. Um, I tried to get him to give me a timeline yesterday. Um, he was gonna call the factory and figure out uh, what the timeline is and when I know, you'll know. Um, additionally, oh, I should have mentioned this at the beginning. We have our Flow Shala staff, mace, club, seminar at the end of July. Go sign up, people. Go sign up. Um, uh, we'll put, a, we had a link under a comment a couple of days ago uh, about that and I think I put out an email about that. I asked my editor to do that. I don't know if he's gotten to it yet, but somebody come hang out with me and swing staffs at my face. Um, I need human interaction. I've been talking to these ponies like way, way too much. Um, and they don't talk back. They just try to bite me. Ponies are assholes. I don't know if you guys know that. Ponies are huge dicks. Um, they, they're little monsters. They're way worse than any other horse on the planet. The smaller the pony, usually the ev eviler there are. The micro ponies, not mean. The, the Shetland ponies and that size, super mean, um, super psychos. Um, somebody come hang out with me and it's the end of July. I think it's the 28th of July is the Friday that it starts. And then it's Saturday, Sunday after that. Um, and we're gonna do Stafe, Matt, Mace, Club. And then we're just gonna repeat that learning cycle over and over and over again. And we're gonna do all the fun stepping patterns with OODA loop drill, observe, orient, decide, act. Um, and we'll break a lot of staffs and then we'll hit stuff really hard. It'll be super fun. Uh, yeah, somebody come hang out with me. Um, dollar sign on the right next to where you text. Okay, I think the, oh, that's about donations. Um, yeah, I think the donations just go right to whatever the YouTube account is. I don't know. I'll look it up because I don't know. I'm terrible at business. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. Um, I just tend to do a bunch of stuff and then I have to have other people tell me how to actually have it make money or monetize it or something, or how much money I actually need to charge in order to break even. If I could just give everything away, I would, but then I would still be below the poverty line and I have to provide for my family. So I can't, can't do that. Uh, Nori Kaneko, obviously Japanese name. Um, construction workers in Japan wear tabbies. They are super cheap. 
There are these cool construction tabbies that I see guys wear that are like Velcro sides instead of that old metal interlace thing. And I've seen some that have hard toe caps on the top of the tabby, but still a flexible toe underneath. Somebody give me a link to those because I want them. And then if we can get them in a bunch of colors, I will be that weird dude wearing a kilt, a hood, uh, in tabbies and running through the forest with a freaking spear. That is who I am as a person. I am not cool. Don't let anybody convince you otherwise. <clears throat> Any plans on a seminar in Europe? I would love to do that. Uh, not right now. Um, I was talking to Maurizio, the guy who founded Hydrocore. Um, and he lives in a small town on the western side of Italy. And we need to figure out if we can do one there. Because there's like this dope abandoned castle on the right on the ocean. And it would be super cool. I just have to figure out if A, we're allowed to go in there and do stuff without getting attacked. He's a local. He'll tell me. Um, and then how, do, how does everybody get there? I don't, you know, I think you have to fly into Rome. And then it's a five-hour drive out there. Um, if there's better places, somebody let me know. But that's the only place I know in Italy where I could potentially do something other than in the, in the UK, Scotland, which doesn't like to be called the UK sometimes, sometimes, um, depending on which, which group of Scottish you're talking to. Um, and that would be Glasgow. Glasgow at Sports Therapy Scotland. Um, I suppose I could call Everyday Athlete there as well well that's sam hugan's gym i don't know if they would let me do it i haven't seen those guys since 2017 uh, but that's a great gym that's a super awesome gym they have a ring they have all kinds of stuff in there i don't know if there's enough space to do this psycho shit i want uh, but they're on like a big empty road we can just do it outside in this dead street in the alleyway which would be super fun um, but i like the italy idea i just don't know if that's insane to ask people to go there i don't know what it, how, how far? I mean, that's a far point in Italy from things like Germany and the UK. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Come, guys, send me ideas. Send me places. Somebody find a giant gym with a high ceiling and let me, let me teach seminars there. I would love to teach a seminar once a month. I would love to just travel the world in a loop like Mike, Mike Fitch from Animal Flow and just teach seminars every weekend. That would be the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal. Uh, Belgium. Yeah, somebody give me a spot in Belgium to teach. Um, I have no idea. I've never shot a movie in Belgium. I've shot in Italy, so I'm fairly familiar with what are the stabby parts and what parts you're going to live through and what are the good parts. And I have some idea of how transportation works there. I lived in the UK for like two and a half years. I'm very familiar with how that works. I know that the train system there is super easy and we could have a seminar almost anywhere there and people could fly into Heathrow and get almost anywhere. And it would be super fun. Train rides in the UK are super fun. Super fun. Um, ah, last question. Christian Thierry. Thierry. I'm really mispronouncing your name, but I like to say Thierry. Uh, speaking of HEMA, we're always doing HEMA with this guy. Um, the huge claim air or an Dop and Soldier two handed sword techniques are just pure heavy mace techniques. It's so cool looking. Yes, they are. Um, and for all of you people who are not going to go out and buy a heavy claymore and, and uh, the spy handers, um, then yes, mace is a way that you can train for that until you get the time and the energy to start doing the pure HEMA technique. Um, if you have videos on the pure HEMA technique for spy hander, let's start turning it into a pure mace series. Uh, Claymore or Spyhander, whatever you guys call them now. Um, great sword. Send me the cool videos of the pure, most basic HEMA techniques, and then let's create programs around that. Let's make that part of that first series of mace videos, and let's shoot them. I'm trying to travel to Italy in a couple of weeks to shoot a bunch of programs in that sweet castle, and it would be cool if we could do that there. Uh, guys, we're at our 90-minute mark, again, as usual, because we always talk way too much, because I love, I love doing the lives, because the questions are super fun and super good, and I get to be as nerdy as possible. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the donations. Now that people have figured out how to do the donation button, uh, so we'll have to do that more. I don't know. Whatever. 
Uh, more money helps me make more programs, I guess. You know, I get to buy food and gas and put gas in the car. Um, this has been Mark Wildman of Wildman Athletica. Thank